Let's go into the, into, uh, the, the mindset of money. I like the word. Uh, uh, there was actually uh, somebody uh, um, who said this morning, uh, mindset is actually denkwijze in Nederlands. And I think denkwijze, never thought about that, the denkwijze. I, I, lo I love that word. That's uh, amazing, Meredith. Well done. But the mindset of money, I can remember Monique and I, when we were only one year married, we, when we got married 20 and 21, we bought a house. Um, I stopped my studies to, you know, to really find a job because with one salary uh, that was already almost 20 years ago, you were not able to buy a house. Well, that, hello, that's the same today. So that was a little bit of a tough season back then. Uh, I decided to quit my bachelor's study and I was like, well, you know what? What I will do, I will finish my bachelor's study later on and happily I, I did so. It was a finance study, so that, that was very nice. Um, but in 2004, we came into this church and um, yeah, when we came into this church, what, what I found was that, you know, this church was great. I mean, there was great production, uh, there were great theological teachings. Uh, there was a great hospitality, a great number of people really, you know, made me feel like home. And I must tell you, it didn't look at all like this. Um, Raymond and Evelyn, they would actually know we were at the studios. And the studios, there was like, <laughs> we had to get here at uh, quarter to eight to set everything up. And, you know, that was actually quite interesting. So all, all of this that, that you see here, that was not there. So we really had to build all that up. Um, but the most, thing, the most wonderful thing that I feel that let's say in the last 20 years has been really adding up to my life was the quantity of teaching that I had on my finances. And I must say that in the beginning, I was, I was, pretty, I was, I, I, it was pretty intense. Uh, I was sitting in, in, in my seat, and every Sunday we would have five to seven minutes, like we have today, about finances, about giving. And I felt challenged. And I felt challenged because I realized that in my life, in Monique, in my life, our mindset was not yet in the right, in the right place. What I found, just reflecting on that a little bit in the last 20 years, that in the beginning when we came in, our finances, if you would really look at our budget, it would be more about, orientated about us than instead of on God. And I think one of the biggest blessings that, you know, that, 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 that we have experienced in our life is that we keep going to church, we always were part of a group. We never stopped serving, no matter what season we went through. And we also, we also gave to the church. And, you know, we did faithful things in, 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 at the workplace as well. But these are, let's say, four key foundational things that really helped us to go into every season that we went through in our life. And, yeah, that was for us a mindset change. Because I realized that, why, did I, why was I a little bit agitated? Because I, I realized in myself that there was a mindset Something that had a strong hold on me that was making that my life was more orientated about myself instead of on God. And that is where that sense of, you know, letting go and letting God, that, that kicked in. But one of the basic scriptures that really blew my mind back then was um, John, uh, 3, uh, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. And it says this, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things as your soul prospers. I find it very interesting because... I have been brought up in a traditional church, and um, um, yeah, I mean, when I came to Christ, I had no notion about prosperity gospel or, or whatever, um, but you know, when I, uh, later on, when I came into C3, I got to understand that prosperity gospel is actually something really amazing, but I never realized that God does not only want you to be prosperous in your spirit, this is, this is the, the Apostle John writing to one of his friends named Gaius. You know, in, in Amsterdam, if you say Gaius, that's, you know, it's not a very good thing to say. You know, it's like a group of guys hanging around there. Oh, that's Gaius. You know, it's rubbish. It's like, Tag van de Rigel, zou je bijna zeggen. But, um, uh, no, but Gaius was actually, he was a really nice guy. I think these are two separate things, actually. He was one of his dear friends. And then he's saying that God is not only wanting to prosper Gaius, in, in the spiritual sense, but also in the physical sense, in the soulish sense. And that was, I find it mind-blowing. Because now what I could expect, I could expect God to really not only move when I was doing things for church and bless me in church, but actually I could expect God to really bless my workplace as well. And why? Because he doesn't all, only want us to be blessed in, this, in church, but he wants us to be blessed outside of church in a workplace. And I thank God for the many Many people that I see around me who actually put it on display is that you show 
in your life that God is blessing you in the workplace, and because he's blessing you in the workplace, you actually experience the life that God has for you. Okay, but let's go back into a little bit of mindsets. Last week, I was preaching the same message, and I, and I, I preached it in the city. And um, the nice thing is, is that, you know, there were a lot of expats there, and I believe that there are here also a lot of expats. So just, you know, not to call you out or anything, but let's say if you're, f if you're not from the Netherlands and you came living here in the Netherlands in the last 20 years, just raise, raise your hand so that I know that's you. Well, that's, you know, that's a lot of people, you know. Yeah, I, lo I love that, by the way. I love the fact that we're a multinational church. I, I, think, I think it's amazing. But, you know, then maybe... You know, for us Dutchies, it's, you know, some things are really have become normal. But imagine if, you know, you're not from the Netherlands and, you know, you go out uh, to, to, you know, with a couple of friends and, um, you know, somebody asks you in the bar and said, hey, you know, um, can I get you a drink? Yeah, sure, you know, great, I'll, I'll have a beer. And then before he even walks to the counter, you check your WhatsApp and you already found a ticky in your WhatsApp. You see, that, that's a little bit of a Dutch mindset. That's a little bit of a Dutch mindset. I, I, think, I think that's quite amazing. I, so when I worked at, at, at Unilever, I, you know, I sometimes had to go on a, on a trip to, to, um, to, uh, to England. So uh, we had a corporate lunch there, and it was very nice. It was very good. But I would always feel a little bit strange if we would you know, have them over to us, because you know, corporate lunch in the Netherlands you know, it, it looks a little bit like this. It's like, you know, maybe two pieces of bread, a little bit of butter, and maybe a slice of cheese and maybe ham, and a glass of milk, of course. I almost forgot that. That's it. Was well, when I went to, to England, you know, there was this, you know, there was sausages, there was bacon, there was, you know, scrambled eggs. There was like all this type of stuff and amazing. It's a little bit of the Dutch mindset. I think, and mom, I know that you're watching, I love you, um, yeah, I, I think, I, my mom has told me this story literally maybe 25 years ago, so she might not even recall, but she had a, a, a great friend called Cora, and uh, this lovely lady, she went over and, um, um, or maybe I shouldn't have named names, maybe, sorry mom, that's actually, uh, I hope you forgive me. Um, so, uh, she, she brought a, a, a pack of cookies with her when she was coming over to my mom. And, you know, not to scare you, this is a funny example, okay, of Dutch mindset. So, it's, it's okay, it's okay. So, um, the, the weekend was over, and then when the weekend was over, the pack of cookies that she brought, the leftovers, she brought back home. <laughs> so I'll just let it sink in for a little while, because I realize it's a little bit of a... So, imagine yourself going to a party for a weekend, Let's say, you know, Monique and I, we would be spending time with David and Hannah, and we would bring a pack of cookies, and then, you know, at the end of the weekend, I would bring the remainder of the cookies back home. <laughs> wow. Yeah, exactly. I would never be welcome again. But my mother is very forgiving and very loving. I love you, Mom. That's amazing. That's Dutch mindset for you. Okay. Good. So... You know, and, you know, the obvious traditional experience that you would have is when you would go on a coffee with somebody, there are only two cookies, you know, one for you and one for me, and that's it, right? So, okay, so I know that, I, that the reason why I really love the fact that we're multinational is that all of that has been banished. <laughs> all of that, you know, the Asian culture is so much present here, it's like, and the kingdom culture, it's like, man, people are so generous here. I love that. I love that. But, you know, there was also, there was also one... I, I researched it a little bit. Why, why is that? Why, are we, why, why do we have that Hollandse zunigheid? Why, why is that going Dutch? Why, why, is, why do we do that? Why is that? So I researched it a little bit, and actually a big part of our culture has been shaped through Christianity. And I think we all realize that, that the whole uh, foundation of Dutch society is based on, on, on uh, reformatic thinking and Catholic thinking. But what happened was that, let's say in the, in the late tw 12th and 13th century, uh, the Catholic Church was basically you know, having a lead on the whole of the Netherlands, and uh, that was basically the number one religion that we had, which was an amazing thing. But there were some people for who were Catholics who, who felt like the way and how the church is going about monetary matters, they felt it was going too far. 
So there were a couple of theologians, a couple of Catholic theologians who basically uh, stepped outside of the Catholic circle and said, well, you know what? Uh, you know, I don't believe in buying myself into heaven. I don't believe in, you know, purging my sins by giving money to church. So what they did is, and, and they, don't, they don't like the whole money and wealth thing that was going on in the Christian leaders at the time. They started something of their own. And they called it modernistic type of worship. So what they did, and there were a couple of great Dutch names who did that, is that they said, well, you know what? We're not going to live that rich life as, as leaders of church we're going to live a life which is sober. And why? Because we want to make a statement that the culture that we believe in, believe in back then is not the right thing. So we're going to show our worship to God, not in a materialistic way, but in a very sober way. And I think personally that that motivation is actually beautiful. I mean, if you want to make a statement, then do the opposite of what you're actually not wanting to do. So I think from a religious perspective, I, felt, I think that this was actually something that God was birthing into these men and women. However, 2,000 years later, and uh, that's, that's the point where, where we're going right in, in a moment, um, as we're going to look in the poverty mindset, is, it has shifted. It's shifted into something toxic. I will talk to that about in a minute. But just let it go, uh, I'll let it go back up again. The Hollandse Zunigheid is also born from goedkoopmansgebruik. Uh, 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 you know, our, we've got great engineers, but we also have got great traders. Uh, if I mean 17th, 18th, 19th century, you know, we did very well, I think. Or at least that's been a financial foundation for this nation. So in a sense, you know, these two mindsets that, uh, or the, let's say the Hollandse Zunigheid is birthed out of something beautiful, I think. Very good. And, you know, if you would just, if, if, if you would be at home, um, if you would Google an inflation, you get 100 articles in the last six weeks, last six weeks that will tell you terrible stories. And I would like to encourage you, you know, if you ha are, have a finance career or you're really an entrepreneur, you know, it's good from time to time to look at it. But I must say that if you're going to read every article, you get, you get anxious. And I'm telling you, and, and I would like to advise you not to do that because it doesn't help your spirit. What I'd rather have you do is read your Bible and believe, like Monique just said, you know, believe the promises that God has for us, because that's where the life will be coming from. And I'm telling you this, if you're currently in a situation where you feel the pressure of the finances, then the reality of it is God has already given you the supply. In Philippians, it says it quite really clearly, is that my God shall supply all my needs according to the glory and riches in Christ Jesus. And the thing is this, this is not the first time that you have experienced lack in your life. You've already had it before, especially for those parents. I mean, 2008 was a terrible year. That was true crisis. So I want you to realize and remember that God has pulled you through earlier. He will do it again this time. And if this is your first financial crisis, don't be upset because A, you're in a great church. And B, you've got a fantastic God who will supply all your needs according to glory and riches Christ Jesus. Don't be put down. Don't be put down by the spirit of intimidation because, you know, the devil will try to use it. He will say, hey, look at you. You know, you're a, poor, you're a poor man. You need to work harder. You need to do this. You need to do that. And what's coming to? The message is actually from the devil, which is a real constraint in your life. A trap is that you need to work harder. But I'm telling you this is that you need to have bigger faith. And faith is not something that, you know, you, you just have. You have to work at it. And how do you work at it? By defeating every single time the, fear, the feeling of fear that's coming on your world. Because when you, when you overcome that... You'll see God's gift growing in your world. So don't, so, so don't be afraid. All right, today I'm going to look at two, uh, three different mindsets. The poverty mindset, uh, the materialistic mindset, and the biblical mindset. And the reason why these mindsets are so important is that um, when you have a specific mindset, then it's, you know, it's just something that you do. You have a specific belief system within yourself, and because of that belief system, you do things automatically. And changing your mindset will make you see that you actually have a decision to make in every situation that you're at. Okay, so when we talk about a poverty mindset, what do I mean with that? Well, poverty mindset is an inner conviction that how we deal with our money is needing to be sparingly or poorly as an expression of our devotion and follower of, to Christ, followership of Christ. Let me just repeat that again. That's a long sentence. And also for Manon. Thank you. A poverty mindset is an inner conviction 
that how we deal with our money is needing to be sparingly or poorly as an expression of our devotion and followership to Christ. This thought of living a life where you need to li uh, live a, a very sober life is not something that you know, has arised, let's say, in the last 500 years. You need to know that this train of thought is actually something that Paul was preaching against very clearly when he was writing the letter to Timothy. When you read the letter of Timothy, then what you see is that Paul is referring to a false teaching. And the false teaching back then was later on being identified as Gnostic teaching, which basically says... Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. Jesus Christ came in the spirit. And because he came in the spirit, everything of the flesh is actually without value. And because it is without value that makes that this false teaching is saying you need to neglect eating nice food, wear nice clothes, you need to neglect marriage, you need to neglect yourself because that's all rubbish, because that's all soulish. That's all not of the spirit. And that false teaching is something that Paul is heavily warning against. And actually he says, whenever you have these people, we already seen examples of people who, who live like that. And you know, you need to get rid of these people in your church. And I think today, you know, what we sometimes feel, what I sometimes hear people saying is that, you know, I need to live a life for God, which is pious. And I need to live a sober life because I believe that money is the root of all evil. I believe that when Jesus said to the rich, to the rich uh, ruler that he needed to sell everything because that would be the only way and how we all can actually live for God and live a holy life. But the problem with that thinking is that actually that neglects you know, who God is. And that actual line of thinking is something that is rooted within a deep self of self-righteousness. And, you know, what do I mean? Because that, that, that sounds quite heavy. I know, I know. But... What I'm trying to say is that when you believe something like that, that because of your own doing, that you can actually have a holy life before God is a total misconception because there is no holiness without you believing that Jesus Christ made you holy. You and me can, do, can add nothing to a sense of holiness on our world. Was it not because of our faith? And also the negative thing about having a poverty mindset is when, you know, when uh, uh, you see other people enjoy the things of life, that's an expression on how you could see it in your world, is that you actually, you, you, you think it's a bad thing. So poverty mindset expresses itself and, you know, you see somebody really, you know, I have a, a pastor friend and he bought a great watch and I love him for that because I know it's his dream. I think that's amazing. But, you know, I also know that some, some, some people and... And, um, yeah, they would say, well, you know, that's not of God because God doesn't want us to be rich. Well, if, that, if that's your thinking, then I'm telling you that's poverty mindset. That's poverty mindset. And, you know, uh, the other expression of poverty mindset is vow of poverty, pinnacle of true spirituality. That, that's what I just said right now. Just going back to the rich ruler. If you say, well, you know what, Peter, we ought to live a sober life because that's what Jesus said to the rich young, young, young ruler. Yes, that's right. He said it to him. But there was a reason why he said it to him. It wasn't because he was expecting all of us to live very sober lives. No, that wasn't the idea. The idea was that this man came to Jesus and he asked him a question. What is it that I need to be doing to have eternal life? And then Jesus was discipling this young man because this young ruler had everything and he kept every word of the law. But the only thing that really had a strong hold on him was standing in between him and the God, calling that God had for him was his riches. Amen. And for him, in that context, that was something that he needed to get rid of. And I think that in the context where we're at right now, we also need to get rid of that if it has a strong hold on you. It's not a principle to sell everything. That's not what Jesus is saying here. That's, that's wrong teaching. So I really want you to have that clear in your mind. Also, one, one, one thing, when you have a poverty mindset, you believe that all the people in, 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 in the Bible are poor. Well, the thing is this, is that most of the people, most of the prophets, they lived a very poor life sometimes, but most of them were, had more than sufficient. I mean, if, if you look at Moses, if you look at Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, even if you would look at Jesus, 
Some, some people say, well, Jesus was a poor man. Well, yes, I believe that when his father, Joseph, when he passed away, I believe that where the Bible, where Paul says that Jesus became poor for us so that we might become rich, that might have been that thing that he's been going through. But the fact is when he started off his ministry, he had a treasury guy. And there was this one moment where Jesus was, the disciples were discussing amongst themselves when Jesus says, you know, do we have enough food? That, you know, one of the disciples, he was contemplating on, hey, you know what? Hey, Judas, how much is in the treasury? And, you know, take that money a little bit out of your pocket and put it back in the treasury, right? <laughs> so when they brought it all together, they were actually contemplating for the 5,000 to buy all them food. That's how rich Jesus was. Jesus was not a poor man. I think it's really important to understand that. Because subconsciously, this mindset of a poverty mindset that leads to a self justification that is unable to meet the standards of God leading to the struggle of acceptance and approval of Christ. You, you will feel that you will need to work harder. But it will never suffice. Never. But one thing would suffice is that the sacrifice that Jesus has brought for us is more than enough. So let's get rid of that. Okay, how do we do that? Well, first... If you feel offended right now, then I'll tell you this, is that I really love you. I don't want you to be offended, but I want you to change your mindset. So after the service, I'll be standing here and, you know, you, you can tell me, you know, how you feel about it. But I'm telling you this, you need to change your mindset. The first thing is that you do is you repent. You recognize that the thing, the way how you're thinking is not the way you should be thinking. And repenting basically says to God, God, I'm sorry, I need to step away from that and adopt this new life. The second thing is that it has a strong hold on you, this mindset. Last week I was in city and it was a fantastic message. Uh, fantastic service, I mean. It was also a fantastic <laughs> message, obviously. But... Um, so afterward, this, this lady came, came in, and we prayed for her, and, and it was great, but she really needed to have a renewal of mind because it really had a, a, a stronghold on the way how she, th how she thought. So we prayed, and I said to her, there will be one person who will be accusing you of not enjoying the life that God has for you, and it's the devil. It's the accuser of brethren. He will say, yeah, Vinant, you know, you've got this, uh, this expensive watch. I, I don't know if that's the case, right? But let's say you buy expensive watch. Yeah, that's not of God, eh, Vinant. And then you feel convicted. Now you've got this beautiful watch on your wrist. And you're like, man, that's not what God wants for me because I feel that. No, that's from the devil. That's, from the, that's, that's, that's not from God. He wants you to have a blessed life. He wants you to be prosperous in your work, in your, in your home place. And you have a great heart for God together with Ineke. And you love serving for C3 Cares, which I think is absolutely amazing. But he wants you to have a prosperous life. And I'm just naming you because you're in the spotlight, actually. So there's nothing <laughs> prophetic on that. But, yeah. Good. I'll take a li little bit more time, actually. I see that uh, lovely Hannah is here. Good. But repent. Um, Get rid of that, uh, the mindset that, that's to renew your mind and the word of God. Romans 12 verse 2 is don't, re don't be conformed to the thinking of this world, but re be renewed in the renewing of your mind through the word of God. And buy something that you can afford guilt-free. All right. Materialistic mindset. Johannes Calvin, as we say in Dutch, or Jean Calvin, not Calvin Klein, he says, where wealth controls us inwardly, God have lo has lost his control. Where wealth controls us inwardly, God has lost his control. I was just, I was just reading, I was just explaining the story about uh, the rich young ruler. And um, yeah, I just explained, you know, what it is that God really wants to have from all of us. What is a materialistic mindset? Well, you can, you can express it in the, in, in the following. Um, what you cannot give away, it has a hold on you. If you have things that actually have a hold on you and you cannot give away, then that, that's part of a materialistic mindset. Materialistic mindset overspends on what you actually do not have. You know, this, this sense of finances that flow out of our, 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 our life because of inflation. We, we did some, some research and I'm thinking about, you know, some things on how we cut, can cut our cut costs, which is, which is good. It's good to shape yourself up for that. But don't overspend what you have. And also materialistic mindset is feeling superior over others, feeling proud on, yourself, on ourselves. 
I think it's very easy, especially if you've got a corporate career or a good running company, is that that feeling that you get on the inside is, you know what, I have it better than others, you know, and you feel proud of that. It's good to be proud of an achievement, but it's not good to have an attitude towards others because that's not what God calls us to be. Paul, he instructs Timothy in, in this scripture, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 and 19, it says the following. And he speaks to the rich. As for the rich in this age, charge them not to be haughty, not to be self-proud, nor to set hopes on the urgency of riches, but on God, who richly provides us everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus stirring up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of which is truly life. I'm doing a little bit of a study in Timothy from a professor from the beginning of, let's say, the 1900s. His name is Professor Walter Locke. And he paraphrased this part of scripture. And I felt it um, a good thing to, to, to share it with you. He, it's basically the same part of scripture, but he puts some nuances to it or accents that I feel is speaking to this church location right now. So he says it like this. He said, I've warned teachers against the desire of riches, but there are other members in your church rich in this world's goods, and they will need your guidance. Bidden not to be purse proud or conceited, not to set their hopes for hereafter on so certain a read as riches, but on God. And him they should try to imitate, for he has all the riches of the world, and he gives them out liberally to us men, so that we may enjoy them thoroughly, so that we may enjoy it with them thoroughly. So they should do good like him. They should have for their riches a store of good deeds. They should be quick to give to others, ready to share with their friends. In this way, they store up true treasures for themselves, which forms a firm foundation. And then he, goes, he continues on a little bit. The accents that really jumped out of me was this. One is that about the attitude part, first proud or conceited, and that we put our hopes on our finances. If you've got a steady job, if, you, you know, if you're making career, then you know, let's say when I started off my career, I earned 1,500, and now potentially uh, per month, and now potentially I could, well, you know, I, I don't know exactly because I'm now working for church, but let's say I had my, my last job, I was earning about 60,000 per year. So, you know, and over the course of time, you know, that's, that's gradual growth, which is great. And it becomes really easy to believe that, you know, you don't need God. Or actually that you stop believing for God because, you know, you already have everything that you need. But what is Paul in inviting us to do here is, as rich people, think about this. And don't be dependent on our finances, but do something good with it. And, you know, I, I only have to close my eyes. And actually, I see you in front of me. But when, at home, when I would close my eyes, I would see all of you. I see you're all so, so rich. And yes, there are people who are not as rich. And we need to take good care of them. And that's why we have a seat free cares me, uh, uh, a church service, is that we take care of the people who are living in poverty on the other side of the railroad because they need it. But what I really feel strongly for us as a church location is think about the season. Think about the riches that God has given you. And let's follow up with what Paul is saying here is that we should store up riches in heaven by doing good deeds, by giving away to those people who are in need, to by giving into a sense of vision, giving into the people that we can actually help. Because the thing is this, with our groups, you know, we, I, I talked to a lady yesterday who invited somebody over. Uh, she was very generous. And the promise of generosity is this, is that the goodness of God will lead to repentance. Is that our groups, we can invite our unsaved friends, our unsaved neighbors, our unsaved work co-workers. And when we have, when we set, set free that sense of generosity to, to those people, they will get into the kingdom of God because they will get it. They will get the love of God. They will get the love of God when you treat them to a nice cup of coffee in your house. When you're just sitting with them and listening to them, providing them a great meal. That's a great way in how to get people saved. And I feel in my heart, and Monique and I feel strong in our hearts, that this church is meant to be an overflow in every street, an overflow in every neighborhood, an overflow, you know, for the, for, for the neighbor in, in, uh, across the street who is sick, that you pray for them. There are, they, they, you, you, you really, we're really called to do that. And why? It's because, yes, we're called to be devoted to Christ, but yes, we're called to preach the gospel. 
And let's not use words like Francis of Assisi said, but let's just do it. And this church is a rich church. We need to be providing for those who are in need. Come into a group. See the need that there is in the group. And let your financial blessing flow into that. All right. So how do you get rid of a financial or a materialistic mindset? It's A, repent. And two, again, is to recognize in yourself, if it has a strong hold on you, is that you need to use the word of God and counter the accusations of the devil, which basically say, well, you know, what you're doing right now, you cannot afford. What you do right now is not good. Renew your mind in the word of God and start tithing. I think tithing, like Pastor Steve preached on last week brilliantly, is that that is our way to be dependent on Christ. The last part that I want to speak into is the, the biblical mindset. You know, what I love about the Bible is that the Bible is very clear on how God thinks about finances, even in the New Testament. The New Testament speaks about Jesus giving talents, which is, which is a lot of money to a lot of people, and then, uh, uh, and then they were doing something with it. God is really into, in, in, into this thing. But biblical finance or money is that we, we acknowledge from the start of it is that we acknowledge that it's not our money, but actually it's God's money. It's God's money and He's wanting us to be right stewards with the money that He's given to us so that we can do not what we will, but what He wants for our lives and that we can run with it. But also to enjoy it. That's what I, just what we just read in the previous part. But an actual renewal of mind is needed for your biblical mindset to kick in because faith is a process. Faith is something that gradually, surely, slowly, whenever you would step out into this new way of living, you will find that it will bring the fruit that God has promised for you. And the thing is this, is that um, if we would look in the Bible, so, okay, so how does God look at finances? Well, just let, lead me, let me lead you into a couple of scriptures. Like the first scripture that, that we just read was John uh, 3, verse, uh, verse 3, verse 2, is that the apostle said, I want you to be prosperous. God's name, it, he, God's name is that he is a provider. Genesis chapter 22, verse 14 says, So Abram called the name the place the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. That's one of the songs that we sing during worship. It's this cracking song. It's amazing. God is a provider. Um, the first miracle that Jesus ever did, he, he provided wine. He provided not just, you know, just, just 100 liters or 50 liters for 200 people. No, it was a few hundred liters. And it was, it, it was, it was too, too much. It was overabundance. God is somebody who takes care of you because he, he said to Peter, Peter, you need to go fish. And then in the fish, there will be a coin so that you can pay your taxes. Well, I'm not sure, you know, I've never heard somebody, let's say, in this age, to, to, to tell me, Peter, yeah, so Jesus, you know, I heard from the Holy Spirit, I need to go fishing, and then I have some money to pay off my taxes. So because I've never heard that story, my recommendation would be pay it every month so that you just, you know, to make sure that you pay it sufficiently. God is a generous father, Luke chapter 15, verse 29, 31. It's about the prodigal son, and he says, and, and, there is this response from the older son who saw the prodigal son coming back. And then he said, and, 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 and then the father's reacting to him, and he said this to him. He said, look, these many years I've served you, and I've never dis, uh, dis, disobeyed your command, says the older son. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, the prodigal son who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And then the response of the father I find very interesting. So he said to him, son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. I think sometimes, you know, we're being Christians here in, in church and we sometimes feel like left out in the blessing. And I, because, you know, because of the mindsets that we carry. But I want to release you from the mindset and tell you this, is that although maybe you've been a Christian for 40 years, all the wealth, all the riches, all the promises that God has put in His Word, they're for you. They're for you to out right now. And the thing is this, is that what I see for our location is that doesn't matter how old you are, this is the season where you're going to step out into something new. And the way in how you can step out into something new is to adopt a new mindset of faith. 
And I'm so happy that actually we're going to talk about the spirit of faith in a couple of weeks. But actually, you know, listen, to, re-listen to the messages. Look to the weakness, areas of weakness in your world where your biblical mind is not just there yet and begin to speak in it, begin to step out in it and begin to see how your finances will get in order. I think there's so many things that I could talk about the biblical uh, mindset. But I guess the one thing that I really want you to, to, to do is really just review your life and, and, and take on your finances seriously. It's not, it's not a light matter. Some statistics say that, uh, uh, that about 10 to 15% of all marriages, they break up because of financial pressure. And that's, that, that's, that's a serious thing. That means that one in seven, one in eight marriages, they collapse because of that. I think it's important for us to really take wise stewardship on that. And I think that's also having a biblical mindset on it. All right. Having all said all of this, I realize that this is, this is not an easy thing. And I realized that, you know, changing your mindset is something that, you know, it takes a decision. It not only takes, it's like going to the gym, you know. You go to the gym, I did it last week. I totally died with my nephew over there. It was amazing, you know, I love dying. Um, uh, but it, it's a little bit finances as well. You just need to get the grid of it, is that you just do it. You, you just do it every week you just, or every month. And find ways on how you can shape up your finances and, you know, just be really realistic about the costs that are coming. But also, like Monique and I, we, we will keep on doing it. We will challenge ourselves to live by 70, 10, 10, 10 principle. 70% we live out of, 10% we tithe, 10% we invest in, 10% we, we give away either to vision builders or to people in church or whatever we feel is needed, compassion. Um, so don't, don't. Don't, don't walk away from that principle because the financial pressure is on. No, actually, when you get God on board, when you get God on your, finan- uh, on your finances, there will be these creative solutions that will be coming out. And also, I believe for many of you, when you start praying for your finances, you will see the stream of heaven coming into your world. It's just going to change. But you need to pray and you need to believe. You need to talk about it in your group. You need, get, you need to, to be open about it. Because if you're stuck, then sometimes you need somebody to grab your hand and pull you out. Because that's God who's wanting to save you out of this thing. All right, well, that, that, let's close our eyes. I'll, 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 I'll pray for us all. Father, I thank you for the, finan- the wheels of financial blessing. God, thank you that these wheels are meant for us to be prosperous so that we don't get stuck, but that we actually are able to move ahead because of these four strong foundations. And I thank you, God, that tithing is something that we do to trust you and to commit our finance to you. And God, I pray right now that where people are struggling with a poverty mindset, God, that they will, that they will let it go. Father, that they will be able to see your grace, your freedom in this moment. That they will be able to actually enjoy, like you say in 1 Timothy 6, to enjoy the riches that we've received from you. Father, that's okay to receive. That's okay to spend. It's what we have. It's okay to really enjoy the riches that you have for us. And Father, I pray for those who are struggling with a materialistic mindset, God. I pray that you will set them free in Jesus' name. God, that they will be, that they will be committing their, their finance to you, God, that you would have the final ownership, oh God, over it, that they will acknowledge that, God, that they will start tithing, that they would start their, their, their superfluous finance, they will put it into causes that help people, to, that they will build a financial uh, a blessing for others as a foundation of the blessings for you, Lord. And Father, I pray that for us all that this biblical mindset will grow in us. Lord God, that we do not be led by the circumstances or what we read in the newspaper, what we look on the news, but God, that we will say, well, you know what? I will stand on the promises of the Word of God because that's my outset of life. My God says that He will be with me through every situation. My God, whenever I ask in His name, whatever I ask in Your name, I will receive, Lord. These wonderful, these wonderful promises, God, I pray that You would that you would let it flourish in this coming season and every person in this room. Father, for those who do not believe, for those who right now Jesus Christ is only a name but not an experience, I want to pray specifically for you if that's you. 
if, if you say, well, Jesus Christ is only a name, it's only a name that I, that I know from a religion, then I want to invite you right now to give your life to Him. And the reason why I want you to do that is not because I'm asking you just because of the sake of it, but because as I'm asking right now, I believe that the Holy Spirit will make your heart soft, will speak to you, He will he'll make you a little bit nervous actually because you feel like, whoa, you know, what's happening in my heart? And I'm telling you this is that God is God the Father, Jesus, they're both in heaven, but the Holy Spirit is here and He wants to be entered in, into your world, but He will not come unless you invite Him. And that's why we're going to do this prayer. It's an invitation of God in your world. So if that's you, then I want to pray for you in a moment. But also, if you, if you, if you, after some, you come back to the church service and you're like, well, you know what? I've messed up my life. Things have gone wrong. I've, I've, I've neglected God. I want to come back to Him. Then if that's you, I also want to pray for you. But if you say, Peter, well, you know what? I tried really hard in, in being a Christian, but I, 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 I don't know if I'm going to heaven. Then I want you to be reassured as you pray this prayer and you, and you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you're saved. So right now, with all eyes closed, I will open up my eyes so that I see who I'm praying for. But if that's you, if you say, Peter, I, want, I feel this feeling in my heart. I want the Holy Spirit. I want, I want God in my life. If that's you, raise your hand. If you say, well, I want to come back to God right now, raise your hand. If you want to say, well, you know, Peter, I'm not sure if I'm going to heaven, but I want to be saved, then raise your hand right now so that I can see. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to pray this prayer with you, and I would like to invite us all to pray this prayer. I will pray a line, and if you can repeat it after me, then you own this prayer that we're praying together. Dear Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice for me. Thank you that because of your sacrifice, I am saved. I can live a new life. Forgive me of my sin. I repent for my old life. Make my life new. Holy Spirit, come and live in me, in Jesus' name, amen, and amen, amen. Father, thank you for this beautiful service. I thank you for all these wonderful people. God, I thank you that you are shepherding your flock, and God, that this season is not a season, yes, it is a season of intimidation, but yes, this is a season of rising, of life and calling and power that you've had, that you've put in us. God, we will rise and shine because you will take care of your church like you've always done, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Fantastic. Well, great, guys. Let's all